Hi, this is Ed Rising, and welcome to Ed's pop matic Podcast, a retro pop culture podcast uh, where everything retro beats anew if you keep it in your heart. And uh, today's episode is going to be based on the Partridge family, another episode on the Partridge family. Uh, we're going to be highlighting um, the Partridge family's first album called Family Album, or maybe just called the first album. I don't know. That's a controversy as to what we should call this album. And uh, we have two special guests. We have Gail Bajkowski with us, joining us again. And we have author uh, Jeremy Ray Miller. <laughs> Johnny. Is... Did I say Jeremy? You see, I had Jeremy <laughs> Phillips rocks in my head. So uh, I apologize you need to get him for on. that. You need to get him on here. That would be fun, <laughs> man. That would be fun. I got Johnny Ray Miller with us today, author of two books. Uh, when we were singing, which is about the music of the Partridge family. And we can put it there. There you go. People can see it there. He is written by Johnny Ray Miller. Okay, there you go. And then he's got a new book. It's called James Cagney with my babysitter, which he wrote with Ryan Cassidy. And there it is there. And so um, I guess we'll get started talking about the books. Could you give us a little overflow, uh, overview of uh, the new book? The new book kind of came about because of the previous book. Um, I had been doing uh, conventions, uh, running the convention circuit when my first book came out on the Partridge Family, When We're Singing. And I was at a convention with Shirley Jones, and uh, it was in L.A., and uh, Ryan, her son Ryan, was there that day, and we just, we managed to have time to talk, and he came over to check out the Partridge Family book, and uh, we chatted a little bit, and um, I think maybe it was the next day uh, that he came back. It was like a two- or three-day convention, and he came up to me, and he just started telling me about this idea that he's always had um, about a book that he wanted to write, and wondered if I would be interested in writing it with him. And I mean, I jumped at the chance. I thought it would be a blast. Um, Ryan seemed like somebody that he, when he was sharing the story with me, uh, I felt very connected to it. Um, you know, it's funny, his, his book is, it's about one day in the life of Ryan as a seven-year-old. Here we go. And so uh, he had been babysat by James Cagney and it was set up sort of on a whim by his father, Jack. And that particular day affected his life um, in ways that stayed with him his entire life. And when he was telling me the story, um, I just kind of thought it was, it was universal. It wasn't just exclusive to someone from a famous family or uh, an afternoon with a movie star. It was about, it was about learning about friendship and um, finding out what it's like to have an adult friend who is outside of your family that that is interested in in you and who you are and, and really listens. Um, and I think that, you know, in our lives, we've all had those experiences somewhere along the way. Uh, and so I just thought it was, you know, kind of a universal story. And that chance to work with Ryan was very thrilling to me. And yeah. um, so, you know, we put the whole thing together and and here we are off and running with it. <laughs> well, that's very exciting. Fantastic. Uh, let me just go back a little bit. We have a, another uh, guest to join us. Her name is Barb Collantine. And, uh, and oh. so it's nice, nice that you were able to join us. And hopefully everybody can see one another. And hear, hear each other. Barb, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I'm having some Wi-Fi. I had to change my Wi-Fi room, so I'm really sorry I'm late. That's okay. You're here. That's the that's the cool thing. And yeah. I we all can hear you. I believe everybody hears Bob Collantine. Bob Collantine. Barb Collantine cool. is my sister from another life. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, I think so. It's then you true. know this guy. Oh Johnny. yeah. I didn't know Johnny were going to be on here. I was like, oh my god, it's so <laughs> so I didn't I'm know so you were going to be here. Oh man. Hi, puppy. And hi, Gail. <laughs> Hi, Gail, I know your name and I listened to an earlier podcast and Ed, I feel like I've known you forever and I'm, I'm so looking forward to this. I, That's so I'm good happy. that you're here. Yeah, yeah there go. Great. Thanks. Thanks for inviting so, me. So uh, Johnny was talking to us about the new book about uh, that, that he wrote with Ryan Cassidy. 
um, uh, how uh, James Cagney was my babysitter. And uh, that's just a, oh, you have it right there. She's very good to you. She's a good sister. From a, she whatever. is. <laughs> she is. <laughs> sister stalker, who knows? Hey, I'll I take both. I can take all I can get, I'll take. How <laughs> did it come about that it would be a children's book as opposed to his memories of the incident? That's interesting that you say that uh, because Ryan wasn't really sure at first, you know, what the style of the book would be, and neither was I. Um, the vibe was towards it being a children's book, uh, but there was so much more to it than that. And and so anyway, we were we had been talking about it, and this is kind of a fun story. I was doing research on, of all people, David Cassidy. Go figure, right? Oh, and oh, oh, oh. yeah, right, right. I know who. So I was looking back at these old newsletters that I had from being in the fan club years and years ago, one of the fan clubs, one of the many. And um, I'm flipping through the pages and at the end of the newsletter, now this is from like around 2001-ish, somewhere in there. They would do like a little update on the family and what the other brothers were doing. So Sean is doing this and this and Patrick is doing that and that. And the youngest brother, Ryan, um, is thinking that someday he wants to do a book called James Cagney Was My Babysitter. And uh, that was 20 years ago, right? That he, he had been talking about this or wow. thinking about it. So, yeah. um, you know, it was kind of, it was really a thrill to help him bring it to life. Um, yeah. You know, it was just really a thrill to do that. And so as we were working through it, you know, we his idea was sort of like it would be a children's book and that's kind of you know it's technically we it's a novelty book and so what that means is that you know it appeals to adults it's got a little bit of history in it of james cagney uh yeah. it's got you know a little bit there's a forward and an afterward from shirley jones she opens the story and closes it and um you know it has that feeling of of nostalgia from this for the adult with some yeah. pictures of Shirley and James Cagney and some bio information here and there. Then the middle section is all illustrated uh, and written really to appeal to a child. Right, right. So, right. yeah, that's kind of how it all came to be. I really like the idea of the story. And um, I was wondering if this was something that was more prominent, being that this is a, person, a, a family living in Hollywood, that, okay, so one day it would have... Um, uh, uh, James Cagney be my babysitter another time that maybe Jack Cassidy would be the babysitter or maybe somebody else would come along now Catherine Hepburn would stop in you know you know or whatever <laughs> there was was there any kind of uh, idea that this was almost normal that uh, someone of uh, of such Hollywood fame could uh, could could walk into this job no uh, this was just it was like a spontaneous thing that happened um Jack and Shirley had been good friends with uh, the Cagneys. And um, this was, you know, 1973 and Shirley and Jack were separated. And yeah. it happened to be on a day where Ryan had planned on spending the afternoon with his father. Well, yeah. something, he had something come something, up. Something, something came up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at the last minute. And uh, so he set it up with Cagney um, at the last minute, kind of, you know, as a quick afterthought and and you know that's how it happened but no ryan was always he talks in the book too about how he was very used to being around celebrities um, yeah. you know and and he didn't really think it was you know that unusual he didn't know when he was really young who james cagney was and yeah. here he was he was very interested ryan was very interested in tap dancing at that time and fascinated with old Hollywood. And he had yeah. a collection of old movie posters. And so when his dad started telling him about who he was, yeah. he, had, um, he had a vision in his head about who he was gonna meet that day. This tough guy. And, <laughs> right, right. So, and you know, tap dancer from Yankee Doodle Dandy. Yeah, and yeah, all yeah, this. yeah, yeah. So, you know, who he met was, was a lovely old man who yeah. was retired. And, and right. like a grandfather almost type figure and, and having that experience for him, um, just a lot of things happened that day in his mind about who people are and, um, 
you know, the relationships that you can have with, with adults as you're growing into that age and, you know, realizing, you know, a little bit more about what the image that he had created his own image in his mind on the drive over there. And, right. you know, only to discover, you know, this guy was a lot like him, uh, a very kind of sensitive and quiet and interested yeah. in animals, um, wow. interested in storytelling. Uh, he had this uh, little display above his fireplace of these little puppet-like figurines that Ryan was really fascinated with because they reminded him of Rumpelstiltskin. And, yeah. and Ryan was always into collecting little gnomes and figurines like that, uh, little Irish figurines. As, you know, there was, okay. they come from Irish descent. So right. there was just, yeah, a lot of, you know, I, I think there was just a lot of bonding that day. And he walked out of there feeling you know, like a little boy who had a friend and that age didn't matter. And uh, that's kind of, you know, the, the one of the themes in the book. Oh, that's a great lesson, too. You know, it's uh, that, that, like you said, age doesn't matter. They can be friends. And so what a wonderful experience. And everybody out there should go out there and, and find the new book. Um, Jack Cat, uh, uh, James Cagney was my babysitter. Uh, Ryan Cassidy with J Johnny Ray Miller. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, not Jeremy Ray Miller, please. Johnny Ray Miller, <laughs> please do that. And, um, and um, of course, uh, since we're talking about the Partridge family, uh, a couple of years ago, he had written this book here. The first real book about the Partridge family music. I mean, or maybe the only book that is out there. When we're singing, uh, I guess this is about five years old almost. Uh, Actually, Absolutely a little more. Fair. It's a fantastic. It's a freaking Bible here. It's absolutely amazing. And it's so detailed. And it's on a lot of wonderful pictures involved here, too. And, uh, you know, really did a lot of nice production work on this. Oh, look at that. Um, yeah. Jeremy did this. Johnny did this. I'm going to call you Jeremy for the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, uh, Johnny put, put the, did this through Kickstarter. Kickstarter.com. And so um, a lot of people were able to give you support in getting this uh, published and so forth and produced. Uh, it's an incredible thing. It's a great gift for anyone that's a Barton's Family fan to be able yeah, to go you. through okay, this can we pick and that up? learn that... so much information. Gail, you had a question? Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, is uh, that available on Amazon or is that uh, directly through you, Johnny? Yeah, it's only available through the website of the same name, whenwersinging.com. Yeah, I would just want to jump in for a second, piggyback on what you were talking about with uh, James Cagney was my babysitter. Can you guys hear me okay? Because uh, after the hurricane- I'll give you fine. After the hurricane here, our Wi-Fi is horrible. I'm in Florida, but anyway, I'll try. Um, I just wanted to say when uh, Ed had a great question about um, is this going to be like maybe a series of famous babysitters that maybe any famous person had. Um, I'm sure there's more of them, but and I think what Johnny was saying is now and, and he said it was just the spontaneous decision. Something came up to have James Cagney babysit Ryan because they were in a pinch, if I'm remembering correctly. And, you know, from the story and talking to you, Johnny, about the book. Um, and I think what's really important is it wasn't, it is a one-off and for James Cagney, when you get to his house and it's described in the, um, book, you're picturing almost like this ordinary house, even though this guy's a gigantic famous star and you picture this guy to come out with the spotlight on him. Right. Um, and he doesn't, as Johnny said, he's like this old grandfatherly figure and what maybe James Cagney doesn't really remember much of, uh, no insult to Ryan at all or James Cagney. It is a thing that happens with Ryan, spontaneous as it is, that he never, ever, ever forgot. And uh, that's why it's a one-off, I would think, Johnny. I don't want to, you know, step on your toes. Um, and it's just a beautiful thing that um, that he never, ever forgot this this afternoon and learned a lot of stuff. And so if you guys haven't ha gotten the book, uh, it's really, uh, you know, a little bit of a, almost like a tearjerker because it's very wistful. Like you're kind of looking back and missing these days of, of no TikTok and no, uh, 
you know, when, when somebody opens the door like James Cagney and he's appears as a grandfatherly figure, it makes complete sense because now you would know he was one because of, you know, TMZ and TikTok and all that. Um, but, um, you, you really need to read it and it's a throwback to our memories. And then of course, if you don't have the other book yet, which Ed, I know you do, but Gail, I don't know if you have it. You were just asking about how to get it. It is, it's, it's like a textbook, but if you're a nerd like me, I read it in like two weekends, <laughs> <laughs> which, which I did not do with my history book. In high school. <laughs> you just couldn't put it down. So anyway, I've talked enough. I just, those are my thoughts on uh, some of the contributions Johnny's made to the Cassidy's um, in general. Yeah. That's Thank great. you, Barb. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, all right. So super cool. So, um, why don't we dive into the new ad to the first album? And uh, Gail, I'm going to start with you. Do you recall when you first got the album? And uh, what was your uh, first memory of it? Yeah, I got it for Christmas, um, 1970, right? That's when that came out. Yeah, and um, yeah, so, and I was, uh, I would have been what, six years old? And I was, I guess, a fan of the show. I uh, played it on my little, you know, suitcase phonograph that I <laughs> in my bedroom. Um, and I just played it and played it and played it. And I loved it. And um, honestly, um, it's I still think it's a good pop album. And I don't, I don't think it's just nostalgia um, that makes me fond of this album. I, I think it's a good listen, even to this day. And Bob, what was your first first reaction to the album? First experience um, with it? I'm going to be honest here and I'm going to say that my first album was up to date, but my sister got this album. She was a little bit older than me. She had no interest in it because she was more of a Donny Osmond person. I think he came along first. Donny Osmond? Oh! Yeah. Who? Wait, <laughs> who? Were, what? Who? The other day. Um, oh. And so what happened was when I started listening and watching the Partridge Family, when it was on, obviously, I kind of stole the album from her. And um, my two favorite songs, which I could probably talk about, um, you know, at some point are written by Tony Romeo. So he has two uh, two on that album. And yeah, right. the rest of them are great. But we as Gail, yeah, yeah, as Gail was saying. Vigorously, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you don't even realize it like, oh, I love these, who, who wrote them? And you go, oh, Tony right. Romeo. Um, and uh, it, it just, they, it holds up. I'll, I'll echo what Gail said. It just holds up as not um, something that um, I would stop listening to like Fleetwood Mac or the Eagles. So. And uh, Johnny, what was your first experience with the album? Uh, so when I came along into the Partridge family, I think I found it towards the end of its run. And so by the time I discovered it, uh, the albums were coming and going out of the stores. And, you know, remember back then there was no eBay, there was no internet. When the records were gone out of the stores, you couldn't get them again. Yep. Yeah, they're gone. And so uh, album was one of those ones that I spent a long time as a little kid looking for. We would go to the store and I'd flip through cutouts. Remember the cutout bins? I mean, I would just go straight to the record part of Kmart or wherever it was we were and flip through the cutout bins looking for Partridge Family Records. And I never found that in a store. We went to a flea market, kind of a ratty old flea market, actually. <laughs> and this guy had a couple of records sitting there for sale. And this was one of them. I bought it for 15 cents and <laughs> pointed me in the direction of Albuquerque had a big gash in it. Oh. So it didn't skip, but it, you know, it chuck, 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 chuck every time it went around for just a, I don't know, a couple minutes towards the beginning. To this day, I can still hear that click, click, yes. click. Yep. That's exactly what I was going to go into next, because I have the same experience. I remember songs with the skip in the song, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that was how I stumbled upon the album. Oh, I shouldn't say stumbled, but, you know, finally found a, my first copy of it. Then, you know, in the 90s when eBay appeared in the internet, of course, we yeah. all ran out yeah. and upgraded all our copies. Right on, right. Yeah, I, I think my well, my first experience was that I, I got the album for my birthday from my sister, um, and so that was this November of 1970. By then, I had already had heard "I Think I Love You" on the radio and listened to WABC 77 Music Radio, WABC, 
And they used to do a thing called double uh, instant replay. And when I was shooting up the top 40, then that would jump into the instant replay area. So I'd get two plays at the same, from a back-to-back, I was the best thing I could possibly have, you know? And I loved it. I loved it from the very beginning. I fell in love with the song. And then when I saw the show and I loved the show and I couldn't believe what was going on, this band, this family. And they'd go out and they'd play together. And I thought it was the greatest idea ever to come up. And uh, and I loved the first album, you know. Um, I agree with Gail. It's it's a very, very strong pop album. A lot of very well-written songs. And uh, what's, of course, unique about that album is that it's really the outside of the Christmas record. Um, it's more focused on the backing singers, uh, Ron Hicklin, John Baylor and Tom Baylor and Jackie Ward with some help from Shirley Jones sourced in there somewhere. And David Cassidy takes a back seat for the most part of the album, but he does have the lead on, uh, on, on several songs. Um, but it's more of a group attempt to think at a, at a group sound. Is that, it uh, true? I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. Ed. Um, was the series, I think, uh, or some, a lot of the, um, tracks were already selected, maybe even recorded uh, before the series was fully cast. Is that correct? Because I, th- I thought they hadn't cast Johnny, yet. They weren't sure they were going to well, cast Well, uh, I could tell you this. Um, none of the music, not, no, uh, the, the cast was chosen by then. Okay. Uh, they, they put it together with a cast and, and the original idea was nobody was going to sing, uh, except for Shirley Jones had the option if she wanted to be on the records uh, and and be part of the background vocals and even have solos once in a while. She she had that option because she was the only celebrity. She was only the established the only established actress on, uh, on the show. So um, so when they put it together um, and they sold the pilot, a guy by the name of Shorty Rogers was in charge of the music then, uh, mm-hmm. and he. He didn't want to stay with it. He didn't want to do the albums. He didn't want to produce, try to produce that many albums that quickly. He was more of a jazz musician, kind of a guy, a very laid back personality. He stayed with the show and he did the incidental music. You'll see his name credited all around the Partridge family. So Wes Farrell was sniffing around for something like this. Wes Farrell uh, had already produced a couple of records and he was, he wanted to produce uh, a TV family show with music in it for records. And so when he heard about this, I mean, he was there quickly. Wes Farrell was a New Yorker. He was aggressive. He was like, hey, you want hit records? Hire me. Like, that was his personality. <laughs> so um, he went after it. And sure enough, you know, they gave it to him. So when he came into the picture, he redesigned the sound a little bit from what the original vision was. And the original vision was created by John Baylor, um, which was that it was going to be very harmonic in sound. Um, he, he had listened to a bunch of pop records uh, for several, just isolated himself, he says, in his room, in his bedroom, listened to music like crazy, then shut it all down and then came up with the sound. And uh, he said that the sound was sort of a morphing of the cow sill sound, the mamas and the papas and the Osmonds. And so he put together, you know, this sort of harmonic sound for it all. When, and, and originally, when they shot the pilot, I think they had like eight singers come in and do those songs for the pilot that were all harmonic. Right. Yeah, but when Wes Farrell came on board, Wes Farrell wanted, it, wanted less singers like that. He wanted less of a choral sound because he didn't think that it matched the image of a family. So they cut it down to four. And, uh, you know, he spotted right away that David Cassidy had that it factor. And he's like, hey, can that guy sing? You know, meanwhile, David Cassidy was feeling, you know, like I feel dumb lip syncing. And, you know, I've been in some high school bands and I could sing. Do you think they'd let me? He goes to the producer, uh, Bob Claver, and says, do you think they'd let me audition? And Bob Claver's take on it was, what took you so long? So, (laughs) you know, they both had the same idea. You hear different stories about who went to who first, but they came together and then, you know, David Cassidy, it was pretty clear what was going to happen there. And I think this first album, this is my take on the first album. There, there was a lot of experimentation going on. They didn't know what to expect. They didn't know, 
if it was good, the show was going to be a hit, if the music was going to catch on. Um, nobody had any idea. Uh, was it going to just be fluff that would, you know, be a quick sell and forgotten? Um, and so, you know, Wes Farrell was pretty determined to have good music, good hits. He, if you listen to the album, you notice that like there's no weak song on any Partridge Family album. We can sit forever and talk about, oh, this is my favorite one, or this one is oh, know, my sure. least favorite one. Uh, I got the Cannonball all, song. <laughs> yeah, they're all like tight, you know, they're all like really tightly well put together songs, whether you like this song or that song. But um, that was, you know, a lot of Wes Farrell's doing and he's surround, Wes Farrell was smart enough to surround himself with the best in the business. So they called him the man with the golden ear. He just had an ear for hits, but he couldn't play music and he couldn't sing. I mean, he could poke at the piano a little, but he could get everyone in the room, the wrecking crew and, you know, David yeah, Cassidy. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, had ear. that ear. And so he they, they joke a lot about how he would, you know, say to them, no, I want it to go ba 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 and, and they'd kind of be laughing and rolling their eyes, but they knew what he wanted. And so I think on this album, there was a lot of experimentation on Wes Farrell's well, part. I think that's why you see, because by the time the album came out, um, David Cassidy was there for the first session, not for the pilot, but once they went into sessions to make albums, uh, the pilot was shot and, and, the, and the music was recorded in December of 69. It was sold in early uh, 1970. And I think it was March maybe that they, you know, got the deal together for the records. And I think then it's May, it's in my book. Uh, the first I think in session. October is when they released the actual album. Yeah. So it was, oh, a, one, it was a, a, a few May, weeks June, after the album was released. July, the, August. Series. Actually, yeah. yeah, it was actually available the week of the pilot, but it wasn't selling and, and stores weren't picking it up. So it was sitting in the distribution centers and Wes Farrell's having a panic fit because, you know, they printed these albums and no one's playing it. And then when the show debuted, uh, it starts to move it, and it started to move very quickly at that point. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I, let, I me see ask, let me ask you always... two questions. Let me ask you, ask you two questions. Um, number one, one of the thing, things about the sound of the album, not so much the first album, but the um, harpsichord. Now, was the harpsichord... Uh, something that Wells Wes Farrell came up with and decided that was going to be one of the base base in, instruments that we were going to use. Wes Farrell does claim uh, that you know that was his idea and that you know he thought it was just something different and it fit the image. Um, I would probably bet that it probably, if it was his idea, it was nurtured by these guys that were the wrecking crew that put this music together and John Baylor, because they really had their finger on the pulse at that time. And these guys were so good. They literally, like the opening hooks of all the songs, they would, you know, Wes Farrell would get all the musicians together to do the tracks. And um, these musicians, before they'd even get started, they would work together and they come up with these hooks and, um, they just play a little something and that they, you know, kind of feel it out. You know how musicians do and then yeah. pitch it to Wes. And they liked to pitch it to Wes before Wes came to them and told them what to do. So a lot of them, a lot of those opening hooks were, uh, were thought up uh, by the actual musicians themselves. Wow. Now, Brian Wilson, when if you look at video of Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys recording in the 60s, uh, and of course, they were working with the Wrecking Crew musicians. And you had mentioned a uh, short time earlier regards to Wes Farrell saying, I don't want the ba ba ba, I want this, or I want that. And they're having a little bit of what the hell does he want, you know? I think if you look, listen to some of what Brian Wilson is doing there, he's almost in the same kind of way of doing because I don't think he was, I mean, as much as he knew music. I don't think maybe he was able to, um, uh, can't think of the word right now, uh, process it from his mouth to, yeah, to the yeah. listener to do exactly what he wanted. And the Beatles were also in the same manner. So I think these people that were not trained necessarily by reading music and learning music, that, and, yet, and yet they still had all these incredible ideas that they were able to um, put together. Um, to make records, you know, it's, it's, it, that's fascinating to, to me. Isn't it amazing how, I mean, these really talented musicians and singers, 
no matter how much school you take or no matter how much, you know, how many lessons you take to play an instrument or whatever, there's still this innate thing that's there. And, um, you know, they have this thing within them uh, where they can hear a song in their head or they just somehow know how to make it work. I mean, somebody may teach them the notes and, you know, the fingerings and all of that, but but they have an innate natural sense that they're prone towards making magic, you know, with music. Yeah. It's right like, on. it's yeah. definitely a gift um, that you can't be taught, I think. Right on, right on. Okay, so let's move on to the next, to the first track on the album is um, Brand New Me, um, which I've always liked. I always thought it was a very strong song. I thought David's uh, lead vocal on that was was very was very strong. And the one thing I like about David's vocals on these early albums, particularly the first two records, is that there's an earnest earnest in his voice that he, he's he's trying very hard to to uh, express something that means something to him. I get that it's very genuine kind of a thing, and uh, and that's something I I like very much about. Uh, brand new me uh, as a song bob what would you think of brand new me um i love it uh it takes me back uh to when i you know first heard it uh as i think a lot of people first you know when they listen to these songs even currently they go back but then they listen you know really and realize why they're still listening um uh this is one that i feel like if david wasn't even in it it would have been like maybe a top 40 hit if it was on like a, Ed, you sound like you were from uh, the New York area like I was. So WABC, like when you said that instant replay, I knew exactly what you're talking about. Um, it, it would be on like, I don't know, like uh, M one of those AM stations. Um, he's not on a lot. There's like two that he's not on, I think, on this album. Um, and I think that they even stand on their own without him. But I think that the thing that I always notice the most when I re-listen, and it's it doesn't bother me, but it's just like, that is just so strange, is that it's not his actual voice. It's still sped up a teeny bit. And so that is something that until you get to Sound Magazine, I believe, you're not really hearing David Cassidy, um, if I can say that, and without any disrespect. Um, but I still love them. Like I love Bandala. Like I love that song. I don't mean to yeah, skip brand song. I don't mean to skip brand new me, but but brand new me I love. It's the first one on the album, obviously. And like I said, I think it's there for maybe some parents. Um, because it's got that older feel to me. It's not like Albuquerque, it's not like uh and to be lovers, the one that one doesn't have David on it. That to me is a little bit more like I love it, but it's a, I don't think he's on it. It's a little bit more, more like my dad and my mom would listen to that. You got the middle ace in the song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I love Brand New Me. And uh, like I said, I think it's a perfect choice to start the album because it is, it's slow, but it's like poppy. But it's then it's you get into the next one and the next bunch that are a journey of a different sound. Um, and I think, like you said, the, that Wes was experimenting. I think that was your point, Johnny. And you could see that by all the different artists that were the writers of these different songs. Yeah. You can see the experimentation going on because you got, you know, Barry Mann, Cynthia Whale, <laughs> if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Um, you've got Wes Farrell's all over this thing. And, yeah. um, you know, I think it's like maybe three songs he's not in. So, yeah, they were all over the place, but boy, they were all over the place in a good way because it's it's jackpot. And even the cover of the album, to me, it's so with the with the family. It's a classic. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It just says, this is what you're getting. It's great. <laughs> Brand new me is perfect start. This is what you're getting. So I love it. That was my impression. Gail, you want to go into uh, point me in the direction of Albuquerque? Do you want to make a comment on um, Brand New Me? Both. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think Brand New Me is a, a great side one, uh, side one opener. Um, I think like you were saying, Barb, it is a little less poppy than some of the other tunes. And it's a, it's a real interesting choice, I think, for an opener. Um, it, you start to listen to this album and think, oh, what is this going to be? Um, and it's uh, and, and yeah, again, like you know, most of them, it's it's uh, or you were saying, Johnny, it's got that hooky open. I think it grabbed you from the beginning, uh, mm -hmm. and then the, 
the transition into Albuquerque is, is interesting because Albuquerque is a lot more upbeat. It's poppier, I think. Um, I, I find it, um, it's an interesting subject matter too, the idea of a, you know, a runaway <laughs> and yeah. a hitchhiker, um, which is something that was you know, in the news a lot, I, I think in the early seventies, uh, so kind of contemporaneous, I guess. Um, definitely, uh, let's see, I'm trying to look at, I did make some notes. Oh, that's another Tony Romeo song. Barb, you mentioned him earlier uh, as a composer, and it, he is one of my favorites too. He wrote, uh, I think he wrote, I think I love you, and then mm -hmm. a couple other things on later albums um, that have always stood out to me as some of my favorites. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in on that, Gail, and say, especially the Tony Romeo ones. When I was young and I was listening to this song, you know, I grew up in a house where, much like you guys, you probably look like you're around the same age as me. You know, Perry Como, Bing Crosby, Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, this is what you're hearing. And you're hearing like love songs with familiar refrains. Point Me in Direction of Albuquerque, when I really understood it, when I was like nine, 10 years old, listening for the billionth time, it's telling a story. And I never heard a song do that before, ever, yeah. ever. And a lot of Tony Romeo story, uh, songs do that. They tell a story with a beginning, middle, and an ending. I mean, I think I love you. I think it's very... um traditional in terms of like opening verse, the bridge, you know, the vamp at the end, whatever you want to call it. Um, but this is the first time my nine year old little self heard a story being, because I country music is all stories and songs, but I didn't listen to country music. I was from New York. Um, and it really stood out to me as I, it just, I never f forgot that I didn't realize that you could do that. And so that's the first time I really saw his name because it just made yeah. an impact on me. Like he was the author of the story. Like you would read a book like Little House on the Prairie, who wrote this? And yeah. I was only nine and it was very impactful. Gail, did you find it when you were looking at the albums that you were drawn to who wrote the songs or who played on the song so much? Um, yeah, even as a kid, I was interested in the composers. Um, it just, and it's, you know, as an adult, I continue to listen to this stuff and, and to more things. I do think it's really interesting um, to see the threads of um, what, who else these composers, who else recorded these composers, like Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil, you know, had a lot of hits. Um, and, you know, I, a lot of different artists recorded them. Um, can't think of, of who right now, other than like like the Monkees and maybe Eric Burden and the Animals, I think. Like there's, there's it runs the gamut quite a bit. Um, and I, that's what I find so fascinating is, um, and it, it's kind of uh, representative of the music industry at the time. And uh, it's, it's creates a nice little, um, nice little picture, I think, of what, what was happening uh, musically in the early 70s. Cool. So, Johnny, do you want to add anything on that? Um, I was thinking when Barb was talking about Tony Romeo and the song, um, you know, it's funny, in the early 70s, story songs kind of became a thing there for a little while. But really, Point Me in the Direction of Albuquerque is kind of one of the first ones that did it. Even though it wasn't released as a single, you know, I feel like it, you know, doesn't get credit for how out of the box it really was. And John Baylor had told me that that's what was true about Tony Romeo. Every song he submitted to them they knew before they even read the byline that it was tony's song when they heard the demo they knew it was tony because it was so different they said he was always out of the box in uh his thinking musically so you know i think i love you so very different than point me in the direction of albuquerque um point me in the direction of albuquerque and here i am like trying to remember what's in my own book but i think it's <laughs> um yeah, I think that it was influenced by uh, by the time I get to Phoenix. It was a follow up to that, I think. Um, I think that's the one. Um, but but I always like for me, um, my thing with the Partridge Family music is, you know, when you're a kid, you can't articulate really why you like something in a deeper way. It's as you grow up and you know, you're asking yourself, why is this music staying with me? Um, you know, the Brady Bunch albums don't stay with me. No offense, right. Brady's, but you know what I mean? Um, and for me, it's David Cassidy's voice. So that voice just like, I could connect somehow with it in some way. Like I felt the feelings he was feeling. And I, I don't know, I could feel that from, from, 
in every Partridge Family song, on TV, on the albums, there's complexity with him in his voice, and it's it connects with you. It's not harsh or abrasive. It's not sappy. Um, I just, for me, I can just somehow connect to David Cassidy through his his voice and point me in the direction of Albuquerque. Just that's one of those ones that does that to me. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's great that you mentioned that because you know, when you think about his voice and the way he would, the way that he re, would emote, uh, you know, you definitely felt that he was, that he believed in what he was singing about. Yeah. You know, he was singing about this, this, this troubled girl, uh, yeah. you know, or whatever he was going on about. And that's something that really stuck with me too. And that's why I really loved that early sound. Now I was having a, email, a Facebook conversation with somebody um, about the voice of David Cassidy and how his voice was altered supposedly on the records. Now, I know that there's, been, there's a lot of different um, variations of this, but apparently it was pretty much commonplace for any anyone, uh, particularly in pop records, to do some kind of adjustment in the record, not necessarily to make the person sound younger, but just as part of the overall production. And so David and the David's voice, if you listen to the actual episodes from that era, you know, his voice is a little higher, you know, he's, it hasn't been stored quite yet. And so there was some adjustment just by, just on the basis of the regular processing of the recording, that I think is why I think a lot of us believe that his voice was altered for those earlier records, but his voice probably more matured within a year or so, particularly singing as much as he did. Remember, he was not a professional singer. He may have been in a band or this and that, but he, and he did uh, uh, you know, Broadway but he really wasn't a professional singer so much. So I think his voice more or less matured. So by the time they got to Sound Magazine a year later and maybe the Cherish album, you know, even that album is very much the same as the first two Potter's Family records. So I wanted to get your viewpoint, Johnny, on what I just said about his voice. Do you believe um, that there was anything that was done directly for David? Yeah, well, I know they did do that because, um, again, John Baylor and the other background vocalists told me that they did. Uh, and I think that one of the things that um, the reasons we zero in and we focus on, you know, that they punched up David Cassidy's voice, which they did on the first two albums, um, they heightened it a little. That was Wes Farrell okay. uh, wanting to do that to create like a pop sound to have it more listener friendly in his eyes for the teenagers. That's what he envisioned. So, and the reason I think that we zero in on that is because David Cassidy zeroed in on it for us. He said many, many times, you know, they altered my voice and he didn't like that. And, and he explains why. And, and yeah. if you look at the era, that's really why, you know, David Cassidy was this hippie who came out of the 60s, this self-professed hippie who loved, you know, he said it a million times, Jimi Hendrix and Jeff Beck oh. and, you know, who? Cream? I mean, how many <laughs> times did he tell us this, right? So, um, you know, I, I think that his idea at eight, 19, 20, 21 years old, you know how you are then, um, you know, life is a lot more black and white in your eyes than it is when you are over 50. And, uh, so, you know, he had an idealized uh, uh, vision of what he wanted, how he wanted to be perceived. And, you know, he loved this gritty, natural, what these bands were doing. And there seemed to be, don't you guys think there seemed to be um, at that time in, in life, it was like there was kind of two different worlds in music. You had like the world coming out of the 50s and 60s which kind of the Partridge family fits in in the way that it was done, which is studio musicians and, you know, punching up the voice or doing whatever to make it radio friendly. Then you had this like new wave that was starting with Woodstock in the late sixties and being earthy. And then here come the singer songwriters. And it's all about really being who you are. And I think yeah. that's what David Cassidy really wanted, wanted to, to be. be. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, he drew a lot of attention to how they did those records. And I think, you know, that's why we talk about it a lot. 
Yeah, but nevertheless, I mean, I still think he made great records, regardless how his voice was recorded. I mean, you listen to a Bandala. A Bandala is a tremendous record, and he's just so vibrant in that in, in that record. Uh, Bob, is that one of your favorites? Bandala is uh, when I first got a computer in 20, 2000, um, and I had to get an AOL name. It was Bandala 2000. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And nobody understood it, and I didn't care. But yeah, I just knew when I got a computer, I, I was just listening to some podcast, and the person said the same thing, um, that the first thing I typed in the search engine was David Cassidy it was in the Parch Family. It's the first thing That's I did. That's great. That's great. Um, and then... Um, I think it might have been this podcast where you were talking about come on, get happy.com and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But um, so I just, yeah, I I love that song. And when I talk about David, knowing David's voice was changed just a very little bit from reading Johnny's book, it still mm -hmm. does not alter the fact that the songs hold up and they are phenomenal. Yeah, and Dallas is just a rousing, bopping tune that you cannot, if you're driving in the car, bang the steering wheel while you are singing that song. <laughs> You can. And, you know, if you're going to talk about songwriters the way you were, Eddie Singleton, uh, he wrote two songs on there, Bondela and Brand New Me. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I think, you know, you can see there's this sort of soulful vibe that comes out of Bondela. And mm -hmm. uh, David Cassidy loved that stuff. And I think he really, you know, felt connected to it, which, again, is why it's so See good. the video, which we've all seen a million times. Um, I don't mean to interrupt you, Johnny, but if you watch the the video, which we've seen a million times um, of the uh, the TV show, when they're singing that, he is hammering that tambourine. He is he is so into singing that song to prove your point, Johnny. I mean, he just yeah. absolutely sings the heck out of that song, and that's yes, one of the yeah. reasons I love it is because I picture that, and he's. He's phenomenally performing that song because it's great. There's yeah. no bass in there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He knows it's great. I think so too. Yep. Yeah. And Gail, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. Um, there's real passion there. It comes through. And um, it, it really, uh, it's one of the songs that, that showcases his vocals really well and also demonstrates his range throughout the album. Um, and th to think that he was, you know, what, 20 years old and he could come in doing that, as you said, you know, not a professionally trained singer, um, but it definitely had talent. And I think it really shows on Bandela. Yeah, I do too. Well, moving on to the next track is an absolutely gorgeous song, uh, I Really Want to Know You, uh, which is uh, performed by the Baylor Brothers and Ron Hicklin and Jackie Ward. And uh, it's just incredible harmonies and it's it doesn't take the album down too much. Although I remember when I listened to it the first time, I was like, well, why, where it happened to David, you know? <laughs> and I think he's not on only moment ago either, but also. Um, very but uh, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think they're both uh, still very much, very, very good songs, well written songs. Um, but, and, uh, and I appreciate the harmonies more so as I got older. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, you think about, think about, you know, I, I really want to know you. I really want to get to know this person. I, I you know, you, you, this is, this is what we were, what Johnny was saying earlier about how the songs have stayed with us all these years. Something like that, 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 that talks to you about wanting to come, you know, um, articulate your feelings, how to be able to connect to somebody. And even in today's world, we're, we're always talking about connecting. You know, I really want to know you. I really want to get to know what you are thinking, what you're feeling, what, what, what's going on. And so that song has always stayed with me, even if it wasn't a David Cassidy lead. Um, uh, so I, I just think it's one of the most prettiest things that they, that, that they ever did. One of the things that I find most interesting about I Really Want to Know You is that so the Partridge family was heavily influenced by the Cow Sills uh, mm. when John Baylor was putting the sound together. In fact, they even went to visit the Cow Sills at one point to see if potentially, you know, the show would be starring them about them. And it was an idea that came and went kind of quickly when they realized that, you know, the Cow Sills were not actors. So um, I find it so interesting, though, like 
this experimentation thing, it's this was a cow sales cover. I really want to know you was had just been recorded oh, by the cow. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. it's the only song that the Partridge family ever recorded that was a cow sales song. So I find it very interesting on this album. I think it was experimentation. Like, okay, you know, this is, you know, we thought about the cow sills, we thought about blended harmonies. Maybe it'll be this song that is the sound for the Partridge family. Maybe this will be what the hits will sound like. So again, wide range of stuff going on in this album. Right, right, right. So uh, now we move on to the probably the most one of the most well-known songs on the album. I can feel your heartbeat. Tremendous, tremendous song. And you know what? I, it's funny because I watched the, the TV episode when they're, recoup, when they're performing it. And I watched and, and, I, and I've listened to the record through the years. And I'm just going to make an observation that, I, that I came to me as, I, I, as an older person. But it just seems to me that Shirley Jones is having too much of a good time <laughs> singing this song with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> good actress you know but you know it's, just, it's a real move and it's awesome <laughs> I can feel you happy what's going on there Shirley you know <laughs> you know I always kind of envision that scene like you know whoever the director was going Shirley we need more enthusiasm and you know and she maybe you know she's like all right I'm gonna give it to him you know <laughs> Oh, what she's having, you know. <laughs> oh, good luck, good luck. And um, would you put that in your top five, then, Gail, or would you be the one of your one of your favorites? Um, you know, oddly enough, it's not. Even though, um, you know, it's it's a um, pretty good rocker and a pretty strong song, and again, another terrific David vocal. Um, and I like it, but it's it's never been one of my favorites. Um, for me, uh, for whatever reason, it reminds me of the theme from Medical Center. If you remember that show, I remember the show. <laughs> I remember the theme <laughs> with with Chad Everett. That that's what that heart pounding. I mean, it's very authentic, I guess. So it's <laughs> what comes to mind whenever I hear it. Okay, cool. All right, so now we move to side two, and uh, one of my favorite songs on the whole whole album and of all the Parker family is "I'm on the Road." Because I was a big fan of the bus. And I could just see them on that bus going out from town to town, you know, whatever their gigs were on that bus. And, I, you know, it, it, it was fan. And again, it's, an, it's a, not a David Cassidy track, but still, my God, it's, it's a great record. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to see now who wrote that song that was a Barry Man and Cynthia Wilde. Yeah, you know, it was. Uh, and boy, I can they, tell you, a, right. I can tell you a really fun story about that song. Um, that song uh, turns out to be the original planned theme song for the show. Uh, and there was a David Cassidy lead vocal that was done for it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it didn't, it didn't fly that way. Uh, the song itself, you know, has a lot of bluesy kind of runs in there. And, you, you know, you kind of wouldn't picture that in that song but it really does and mm -hmm. uh, it's another one where you know i I'm, i bet david cassie would have just loved to have had his his lead vocal released instead of the harmonic you know vocals and you would you know no one can answer why wes farrell changed his mind but i think the answer is obvious he heard this one uh as uh better than the david cassidy lead vocal for one reason or another whether it was to experiment on the album or whether it was the sound that he envisioned that would be the theme song um and then they you know they abandoned the idea it was all it was also planned to be the second single from yeah. after i think i love you oh really yeah See, that's that's the other thing why wasn't there a second single i would have put a heartbeat as the second single i don't know yeah you know what's what was going on but yeah, Wes Farrell had said later in life that he regretted not releasing I Can, uh, I Can Feel Your Heartbeat as the second single. Um, but the thinking at that time was, uh, we want to sell albums, not singles. So the idea, and they were selling millions and millions of albums. So why release singles when you've got them buying the entire album? 
that was kind of like the thinking. I, I, I know what you mean. I always kind of wondered why there weren't more singles too. You know, funny, I'm a big Beatles fan. So I follow a lot of things into how uh, things were done with the Beatles. And, uh, you know, they were constantly having to release so many singles and then so many albums and then albums, songs uh, that were singles weren't necessarily always on the albums. And uh, of course, it was also complicated between the Capital USA releases and the Polyphone EMI releases in Great Britain. But I, I guess by 1970, maybe singles, which were still pretty prominent, I guess maybe they were falling down a little bit as far as the record company's decisions as to how to release music. Um, yeah, and I'm wondering, is that, you know, the way the music industry was going right around 1970, yeah. they were, you know, pushing albums over singles? Right, I'm not, right, I don't right. know. Yeah. Okay. All right. And, um, okay. And uh, Gail, do you have any re remembrances on On the Road? Oh, yeah, it's one of my favorites. Still love that song. Um, I would love to hear David's vocal on that. I think that would be tremendous. Um, lyrically, musically, I think the song is great. It, it has so much imagery. You do get the sense of, of being on the road, and I, I, yeah, I still love it. Mm, absolutely. And Barb? Um, I would say on the I'm on the Road is a top five of all their albums, uh, The one of my top five songs. Um, I, I love it musically. Um, I'm, I don't want to say I'm glad they didn't release the David version. I've heard it. It's great because David can do no wrong. But this song is perfect, you know, either way. I think to me, it, it's like a mountain range. Um, it goes up and down and up and down. And it's just beautiful musically. And I can get emotional talking about it because it is just... You know, this album is like it's kind of really impacted my life, and um, this is one of the songs that uh, it's just a beautiful musically produced song, and I love it. Well, nothing I know beats this feeling being on that road. So, yeah, yeah it's yeah, a great one song. One I love favorite. it too. Yeah, one of my favorite lines I think is later is that uh, in the bridge when they it's something like um, watch watch the countryside unreeling, watch it all unwind or something. To me, that's yeah, that's really. Yeah, the Im imagery is there. No, I got to go and look up. Uh, maybe it's in Zani's book. Zani's book. Everybody, <laughs> when we're singing, go to kickstarter.com. Go to when we're singing.com. Get the book. <laughs> uh, but, you know, to find the lyrics, because um, I that used to drive me up the wall. What the hell are they singing there, you know? And so, you know, it's, uh, and because I, I don't, every time you go on the line, I'll go online and you, uh, and you look up lyrics of a song. Not not always got, getting the right lyrics either. So, but um, it, it is curious to what the what they were writing there. Um, sometimes you make up your own stuff, you know. Um, <laughs> to be lovers, to be lovers when you're not in love. Oh, it's a sappy song on the album, but I still love it. You know, <laughs> um, a sad old tree whose branches will not grow. A beautiful valley filled with sand. Uh, anyway, it's a good song. I love it, and uh, and that's uh, uh, David Cassidy singing along with the uh, Baylor Brothers and Ron Hicklin and Jackie Wood. Um, but it's a beautiful little song. Another so song that I always sorry, go ahead, Johnny. Uh, it was another song I see as experimentation. If you listen to it, there's a little bit of a like a Latin flavor going on there. You know, um, I just am amazed by. I don't know, the brilliance that went into thinking through this album. I, I, it is, I just think it's a brilliant album and way underrated because of the experimentation factor alone. Yeah, you got that Spanish guitar in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And that, that goes back to Bandala, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so it is interesting, some, a lot of the experimentation that, that was done. Um, okay, now the next track on the album happens to be one of my particular, now we're moving to, to the big three. My favorite, one of my favorite songs I've ever that they ever did is Somebody Wants to Love You. I think that should have been a hit single. I, it was a brilliant song. Um, I just, I love it. Again, you have to remember now, I'm nine years old, right? Nine, ten years old. And every week I had a different crush on a different girl. 
you know, in school, you know, so if somebody wants to love you and there's any rising, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm always embarrassing myself left and right with, with girls in school. And, and one of my favorites, one of my favorite uh, stories is about me. And uh, I don't mind sharing this with the world. What the hell? You're going to find out about me anyway. So um, I had a crush on a, a teacher. Uh, she was a teacher's aide. And so we had a class party towards the end of the year. And so everybody bought a record, whatever. We had a record player going on. So, of course, I bring the Parker's Family album. We're playing that song. Now, that song comes on the thing there, and I jump on top of a desk, and I start singing, somebody wants to love you, and I'm pointing right <laughs> at her. Oh, God, oh, my. I, had, I had no edit button back in the day. I still don't think I have an edit button. But, uh, okay. You know, uh, if we're going to start telling embarrassing stories, I'm going to Oh, good. Let's do it. So I, I have a background in the theater. You know, I worked in the theater for a long time, and I did some summer stock. And I once sang that song as an audition song. Acapella, no less. Acapella, wow, it's challenging. Yeah, but the punchline is, I didn't get the part. Oh, no. <laughs> but That's I love that song, too. You know, yeah, that it's a great those, song. You know, it's just one of those songs you can just belt out, and it's really direct, and it's just really expressive. Um, Mike Appel and Jim Credicos wrote that song and they had had it before the Partridge family and didn't think, weren't, wasn't so sure it would be right for David Cassidy and Wes Farrell heard it. And he said, I want that song. And boom, that's how that one happened. Cool. Gail, did anybody sing that song to you? No. <laughs> Sorry to say. Gail, I'll sing that song to you. <laughs> We'll sing it to you. We'll sing it to both of you. Uh, somebody <laughs> yeah, wants to love you. Uh, oh, it's boy. Great. It's great, great. Um, all right. And um, and now I guess we move on to the, no, the song, the number one song of all time in the Partridge Family Annals, as far as I'm concerned. It's I Think I Love You. Right on, baby. Bob, would you like to, to share your experiences with I Think I Love You? Um... Well, I can remember this embarrassing stories. And I'm going to say <laughs> second grade, we had a grab bag at Christmas and everybody brought in their little gifts and the teacher put it in a, in a bag, you know, and uh, somebody had the, I think I love you single that they brought and um, they wrapped it. So you could see that it was what it was and it couldn't fit in the bag with all the other. So it's stuck on the top. So the person that got to pick first, <laughs> took that single oh. <laughs> and it wasn't me <laughs> but um you know I don't know what to say about this song it is the Partridge Family song that everybody knows you just shove a microphone in somebody's face and you sing the first line and they come up with the rest I mean it just makes the Partridge Family most recognizable besides the bus in my opinion um <laughs> I would say also that um uh my one of my favorite memories uh is probably from about i think you were there johnny in uh neptune king neptunes or something and uh in uh we were doing the bench ceremony you were there johnny uh with your books and oh um, yeah 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 and uh 45 rpm was playing songs and yes and they started playing, I think I love you. And you've got about 60 women and a bunch, a handful of very patient husbands sitting by. <laughs> and they, they cue this song up and they start playing it. And we are going nuts, singing and dancing with each other, singing. Each other. <laughs> I remember, and I just remember thinking, I have never sung this song in a room full of other people. I've only sung it when I was vacuuming, when I was like 20 or 30 and still listening. And I was like, nobody else was that I knew was still listening. You you certainly, when you were going to bars and when you're 25, 30, they weren't playing the Partridge Family. That was 15 years <laughs> earlier. So, um, and they wouldn't have played it anyway. They were playing Jimi Hendrix and Cream, you know, what David was looking for. <laughs> um, so to me, I love this song because it is just the quintessential. Um, it's first of all, it's Tony Romeo, so there's not a mistake in it, not an extra comma, not an extra breath, and it's just the quintessential sound. Um, and it started the ball rolling, and it uh, it's just got a special place in my heart that I'll never forget. So that's it's great. beautiful, Barb. Thank you for sharing. And Gail, 
Yeah, it's catchy as all heck um, from the very beginning with the ba 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 and the, is the harpsichord I think in there and um, yeah. it, it's kind it's anthemic I think and then it, the the really strong ending where David's shouting you know yeah I I think I love you you know it's uh, it's just from beginning to end a uh, terrific song. Yeah. Yeah. Tony. Man, I could talk for hours on that song alone. Since Barb brought up that um, King Neptune's, uh, was that? I I hope we're right about that, Barb. I can't remember the name of that place, but no, that was, it was um, in Lake George. Was it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, in Lake George. Um, I had gone. They asked me to come up and set up a table and you know sell books, and um, I had a moment. You know, it was. I think that song also, and I remember because I had to stay at my table. And I could, I was set up in a place where I was kind of like right beside the band. So I'm sitting beside the band, seeing the same thing that the band was seeing, which was all the people singing and dancing. And I remember just the jubilation and the expression and the, like, I wanted to go over there and just be part of that. And, and I think that the thing I remember having this moment of watching that, I'd never seen a group of people or been part of a group of people at that point in my life still celebrating the Partridge family. Mm -hmm. And David had, you know, just passed away. And all of a sudden I just had this feeling of, of how, you know, it's up to us now. That was the feeling, the overriding feeling I had at that event was David has got up there and sang to us all these years and given us this. Now we got to keep it going. It's, right it's up to us to keep it going now. I like that. Um, I like that attitude. Very that's cool. how I felt. I f- had this experience there. And I just, I just remember that feeling and that thought coming to me and like an epiphany, you know, it's wow. us. We are, we are the ones who will push that legacy and keep it going. And that's it was beautiful. when they were, when they were all dancing and singing to, I think I love you. And I mean, singing and it, dancing. It was, it was just so much energy that I, yeah. I, God, I, it was so much energy in that room. It that was night. that one. And it was, um, I woke up in love this morning. Yeah. I, and I remember and looking, I remember looking over at you, Johnny, cause I was, I felt, I knew you at that point. And I remember looking at you and, and your face was like, what is happening here? Exactly what you were describing. I remember seeing you have that moment and we wow, were all so- that moment. We were all. Happy. Yeah, it's true. That's it was great. very, uh, a moment of personal revelation and mm-hmm. something that was happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember when I went to um, Atlantic City uh, in 2000, Labor Day weekend of 2000, David Cassidy had been performing at Harris in Las Vegas and he moved the show to Atlantic City for that weekend to, I guess, to promote it. And he was doing, um, he was doing like a, it wasn't, a, it wasn't at the Copa, but he was still doing his, uh, his uh, Sinatra type character. And he would do some Sinatra songs and some, uh, some Dean Martin songs and uh, some other songs. And uh, he, he loved it. He was having a great time doing that. And then he would come out the second half of the song, he would do the Parker's family on and his own songs. And, uh, and that was great. But I remember the experience of being with all these women and all these guys and all these people that were just fans and having a celebration. And it was the, really the first time that I was able to experience that because most of the time uh, that I was young, you know, if you were a Potter's family fan, well, you know, you got beat up, but you got you thrown into the locker. Or you have, you know, <laughs> whatever, you know, things like that happen, you know, you know, you know, I wasn't, you know, I could have, I could have become a deadhead or something like that, you know, and gotten, you know, <laughs> gotten along with everybody, really, if I wanted to. But you know what? I was a rebel man. I'm a bartered family fan. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so I got into a lot of trouble. But anyway, it was a great experience and uh, similar to, I think, to what you and what, uh, uh, Johnny and, and Bob had experienced. And um, thing, the thing with I think I love you is that in my personal opinion, I think it's one of the top pop singles ever released by anybody. It is right up there with I Want to Hold Your Hand. It is an infectious tune. It is written and, and produced perfectly. And of course, performed brilliantly by by, by David and and the the Baylor brothers and 
Ron Hicklin and Jackie Wood. I mean, it's just absolutely, it's just a gorgeous song. And I love it so much. And it, it means something to me. You know, like I said earlier, as a kid, I had a crush on a different girl every other week or sometimes longer, more than two weeks. But, <laughs> but I knew <laughs> that feeling. You know, I experienced that, you know, as a young person. You know, I'm in love. And what does that mean? What's a, what, a, what can I say something? What should I do? What is it? What is going on? And so it perfectly articulated how I felt. And so I absolutely adored it. I'm so thankful, thankful to um, who wrote it? <laughs> Tony Romeo. <laughs> Tony Romeo and, and Wes Farrell and David Cassidy and the whole team for making that record. It's, it's my, 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 my favorite record of all time. Yeah. That's great. And so uh, the last track on the album is called Singing My Song. And uh, Johnny, you were saying that I'm on the road could have been a, a theme song option, but I think Singing My Song might could have also been a, a theme song option. Well, the woman who wrote Singing My Song, Diane Hildebrand, uh, is credited for uh, the song When We're Singing, which we all know was the original right. first season theme song of the Partridge family. The whole reason I titled my book uh, was a little rebellious in my part. Everybody said, oh, you know, it's got to be Come On, Get Happy. Well, no, the first theme song was When We're Singing. Uh, different lyrics, same music, but Diane Hildebrand wrote Singing My Song then, and she wrote that um, kind of for herself, kind of as an expression of how she always wanted to just burst and out and sing her own song. She had done a lot of um, studio writing uh, and was one of the only female songwriters that were signed uh, from that Brill building era. Um, and so singing my song was a very special song to her. Yeah. Well, I just, I love the, uh, I mean, I'm like, everybody in the world would love to sing that, you know? So yeah. yeah. And that could have been another single. I mean, if they really wanted to push out singles, that, I mean, it was a B side, I think. So I think I love you, but. You know, it's funny you that know. you bring up the daddy dum, daddy dum. When I was talking to Diane Hildebrand and getting to know her for, for the book, um, she told me she had a, a had, a solo album and so I went looking for the solo album and I think I bought it on eBay and I listened through it because I was listening for um, signs of you know her her personality in the song and there's a song in there where she does uh, another one of those types of things where you know it's boop de boop de bop de bop or whatever it is but she does it for you know quite a while in there and I thought you know wow this is you know she really is in that song. It really is her yeah. song, you know, yeah. untouched yeah. by by anyone. Yeah. And Gail, your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a uh, terrific album closer, um, up-tempo, um, and kind of, uh, you know, kind of bookends, I think, the album really well. Um, you know, talking about theme songs, um, why isn't the theme song on this album? Any, do you, Johnny, do you have any idea? I don't know. Uh, other than here's what I could tell you is that the original plan theme song was on the road and they were trying to replicate what the monkeys did. So the monkeys had a hit and they had, you know, Hey, Hey, where the monkeys was also a single was also on that first album. So I think the attempt was there to copycat and the press release did go out and it ran in the trades that the first single would was, I think I love you. It would be followed up by the second single on the road, which is also the planned theme song. So I think that that was the plan, but oh, yeah. um, you know, whatever happened there, I don't happened. know. I'm, we can only <laughs> speculate. Yeah. Right. Was it a wonderful 50, 50 some odd years later, you know, we still care so passionately about this music. Yeah, and, that's because it's and, good uh, music. You know, all right, all right. It's good it? music, right? Yeah. I mean, that's why yeah. everybody loves the Beatles and everybody loves whatever it is that's lived on because it's good music. And, you it know, is. we're still trying to strip away this image that people laugh at and show the world. Uh, look at the music and listen to the music. You that's know, right. put the pictures away for a little bit and listen to the music and you'll see. Right. I mean, I think that the marketing uh, for the Partridge Family Records was a hindrance, certainly a hindrance, and the, I think, oversaturation, saturation, because if you think about it, you know, over the course of three and a half, four years, 
there's what nine albums released and then there's several david cassidy solo albums and so that's a lot of work well, the marketing was kind of you know it's a catch-22 don't you think where you don't have this out there it doesn't exist without the marketing and they had to market some kind of image they were doing a tv show mm -hmm. i mean and we all love it still um sure would this music ever have existed without that probably not no. um you know but you know then having to try to break the image and get away with get away from it was david cassidy's lifelong challenge and um you know you know, I think some people do do that. And, you know, I don't think he ever really did. He was successful and yeah. he's, you know, he proved himself over and over and over again, how talented he was and he had hits and all of this, but it still seemed all the way, you know, to the end that everybody, you know, still wanted to talk about the Partridge family, you know, and you still see that with the monkeys, you know, all the, the throughout their career, similar yeah. type of thing, you know? And so, you know, um, Anyway, uh, this has been fantastic being with all of you and discussing this music and and uh, a first podcast on the music of the Partridge family, the very first album, which uh, I guess I'm always going to call the first album as opposed to family album or album or whatever they want to call it. I will always call it the first album. That's just the way I see it. But you can call it whatever you want to call it. I don't know some people have called it a lot of other things, but you know, it's, it's a Paul's family show. So I think we all like the album, right? Um, I think you're right. So I'm going to go around and ask everybody to just reintroduce themselves. And if there's a website or a Facebook or something that they want to sell, Girl Scout cookies or whatever they want to do, uh, kind of promote that stuff. And uh, Barb, we'll start with you. I don't really have anything to promote. Um, <laughs> just a humble retire. <laughs> um, I would no, I would just say this. I'll just say this about singing my song. Um, just to go back to that for real quick. Um, when David died, uh, I got a million text messages in the, in the middle of the night from all my friends who had heard about it, and I had gone to bed because you know I'm an old lady. And I woke up in the morning and I found out and I was, just, I had to go to work and I was, I mean, I can't call in sick for that. I, my, I mean, I couldn't. Um, I'm a teacher and I went to work and as I'm driving, I was shaking. I was shaking because very often when I'm on my right way to work, I would listen to Parch Family or listen to whatever I was listening to, but I would listen to Parch Family. I had the CDs in my glove compartment. Mm -hmm. and I was afraid, I wanted to listen to a song to just feel it, to acknowledge David and, uh, you know, and I picked singing my song. That's the one I picked to put in as I was driving yeah. to work. Aww. And I don't know why, but that is the one I picked. And I was sobbing as I was Aww. driving. And then I got to work and I was going to, I'm going to say there must've been about maybe five or six teachers that checked on me throughout the day. You know, are you okay? Because okay? they all knew that, Aww. you know, I loved Aww. him. But anyway, um that is the song that i listen to because it i love it and i mean gail you you said it, it's a great way to end the album um but um so i'll just say uh i'm barb collantine and i really appreciate you inviting me on this ed um it was really fun and um i do the david cassidy virtual fan club on facebook if anybody wants to uh, join it if they didn't join it we're doing the uh tribute walk that karen ranieri um does we're doing that virtually this year uh, through the David Cassidy Virtual Fan Club. Uh, but otherwise, I'm also part of the I Think I Love You Animal Foundation um, that has to do with the Partridge Family things. But otherwise, I'm just uh, living my life, singing my song, doing my thing. <laughs> I'm on the road, whatever. <laughs> Bum, da -da dum da -da dum 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 <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Barb. Thank you, I mean, uh, Gail? Uh, yeah, I'm on Facebook. I'm a uh, 60s and 70s pop culture fan. So you can find me on there on uh, any page that follows any of that type of stuff. Cool. Excellent. And then we have Johnny Ray Miller, not Jeremy. And uh, <laughs> he's written a couple of books. We have uh, When We're Singing, uh, the Music of the Partridge Family. It's your Bible. All right. So you guys can dig that. And uh, uh, Ryan Cassidy's book he wrote with Ryan Cassidy, and it's uh, James Cagney was my babysitter, and so um, <laughs> that's pretty exciting. And we have got to come to uh, pick that pick that up there. So uh, Johnny, can you give us a little bit of uh, where we can uh, contact you and where we can get your books and things like that? 
Sure. Um, you can find me and the books all at whenwe'resinging.com. That's where I am, where I live, where my life exists. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, look, guys, it's great having you all here. And thank you all to my listeners to uh, join us today on this very special episode. And we're going to have a few more Partridge Family episodes coming up based on each of their next few albums. And we'll talk about the TV series and we'll talk about fandom and all kinds of things. And hopefully we have some more special guest stars and things like that. And uh, so I thank you all for joining in. And I'm going to say good night and remind you that this is Ed's Popomatic podcast, a retro pop culture podcast where everything retro beats anew if you keep it in your heart. Good night, everyone. Ed, Ed thank you so much. Thanks Thank for having you. me. Thank you. Bye, Daryl. Bye, Johnny. Bye, Bye, Bye everybody.